all, all good. I don't know if this is working, but it's green. Ah, look at you. Crikey. Thank you for coming. Look at this. Excitable people. Collaboration. Well, so here we are with Collabora. Um, I hope this is what you want to hear. Um, one of my concerns is that I've given similar talks in the past. So, so maybe we have lots of time for questions at the end. So, so I tried to do some, some uh, different things this time. So one thing that we're really eager to do is to get Collabora Online reused in lots of different places. And there's lots of innovation going on out there. And lots of people have great ideas of how to use documents and make them look better uh, on the web. And we would love to integrate with you uh, to do that. <clears throat> So one of the things that we are really useful and, and for is converting documents to different formats, which seems like an easy thing to do, you know? Uh, but it's really tough. And to wrap that up nicely for you, we have this beautiful REST endpoint. And it looks so simple. You know, you just do this curl command. Uh, brilliant. And you ignore certificates. OK, so you should remove that in deployment. But, uh, you know, and uh, out of it, you get, well, what do you get? You get your text file turned into a docx. That's an easy one, right? But, but imagine you wanted to convert a PDF or you know, a, a PPTX into a PDF. Or a very common request is converting PPTX into animated SVG. So we can do that very nicely. We can produce XHTML out of it. You can run in your browser. That's actually how Collabora Online does its presentation thing. So you can get animations and presentations. You can understand the structure of your arbitrarily horrible, say, binary PowerPoint file. And you can dump that into something you can parse and read and interpret and mash up and do cool stuff with. And the good news about that is that, well, so, so people do this already in lots of horrible ways. So to, I, I will pick on someone. I don't know, is there, is there any, um, who do we have in the room? OK, let me think. Uh, what, what integration do I particularly like? <clears throat> so there is an unnamed open source project. And, and when it tries to convert its files uh, to show them in its, its Jitsi-like, remarkably Jitsi-like, a video, no, no, not just see. Uh, I, I forget. One of these video conferencing systems, big blue button, let's call it. Um, it. It essentially has a shell script, and you know all of the good, beautiful software architecture stops at the point you want to convert a document, and uh, it launches a shell script which starts a Docker image, which then launches another shell script in the Docker image that copies a file into it with some horrible command that then converts it via a, another shell script that launches an Office suite that sits and talks to a you know RPC, and then. You know, it's just absolute horror. And if any of this hangs or dies or crashes or burns or uses more CPU or finds that one document that has a real problem, you're just doomed. You know, you, you have to write all of this life cycle management nightmare. And the good news is, with our beautiful API, you don't need to care about any of that. You know, deploy the Docker image, job done. If it's too big, we'll time out. If it's too horrible, we'll tell you. Um, and it's all, all done for you. So that's kind of good if you want the whole document. Often, though, people have enterprise file sync and share. They want, they want to see their documents. You know, they're fed up of seeing a, a, an icon. They want to see what's inside it. Um, so, so again, we can convert your document to a, an easy thumbnail very trivially. Nice big image. You can shrink it down to whatever size you like. Uh, and that's pretty good. So we're really eager that people use it everywhere. Uh, and so we've, we've written most of the work for you already, so you can use it. And, I think it's Apache license, some really liberal, you know. I'm more of a copyleft guy, but at least I understand. Some other people aren't. So, you know, in, in the language of, of choice, we probably missed uh, Ruby. I, I'm going to get in trouble with, uh, you know, Neil later. But uh, there you go. And we've done a whole load of features recently. So, so one of them I was really surprised and encouraged. I was talking to um, someone from a European office full of lawyers earlier. And... Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but they really love citations. That's, that's, you know, they're all court cases, of course. I always think academic uh, citations. But you know, l referring to other legal cases is this massive worldwide web of knowledge about what's fair. You know? And uh, anyway, so we've done lots of things with Zotero. So one of the things that you can do if you have a Collabor Online integration now is to just to push. Uh, you know, we added all this, this citation stuff in the, in, in the toolbar here. Um, and, and Nextcloud implemented this. And all you need to do is provide a box somewhere that you can set this API key. So Zotero have a very nice REST API. And then we, uh, we plug into that. And you send us this, uh, we have this user private info. So we have a user info which has things like avatars and extended information about users that we send to everyone in the UI. We thought it was best not to send your private key to everyone. So we added this extra tag, user private info. And so when you connect to Collabor Online, 
uh, and embed it in your iframe, you need three methods. Uh, get, so we can get, get the file and show it and render it. And then a post, so we can send it back again when we've edited it. So that's the save. And then there's a check file info. And that basically tells us about you. So, so who is this person? You know, we've got a, a path thing, a URL for the document, and we've got a opaque identification password token. But what's their name? Tell me their name. Tell me their, you know, what they look like, their avatar and this sort of thing. And so you just send this back there, and bingo, suddenly you have beautiful integration with all of your um, citation libraries. Uh, you don't need to run a Java app on the side and then talk. It just, it just works really nicely and updates all of your citations beautifully um, with, a, with a familiar interface. So that's, that's kind of nice as a way of integrating uh, sort of two things together through a very, very simple REST API into a nice UI. Um, yeah, so language tool is something else I love. I don't know if uh, Daniel, Daniel's, he's probably a rich man. Grammarly, you know, has set a price point for, uh, uh, does anyone get Grammarly adverts? Has anyone watched YouTube has been plagued by, yeah. So, so, you know, there are many ways to create value in the world. You know, one of them is, of course, to create value. The other is to uh, tell people you've created value. And, um, you know, and, and I think often as engineers, we forget to tell people that we've created the value. You know, that's the problem. We, we, we do it all, and then there's no marketing. I think Grammarly is probably the extreme example of, you know, marketing versus uh, value. But anyway, so they, they can sell somehow for 30 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, something like that, a subscription to their web grammar checker that sends all your information to someone else and uh, sends it back, you know, with, with, with grammar checking, uh, which is great. But because they've set the price point, uh, there's a great company in Germany, uh, I think based in Potsdam, that make, well, they already made an open source grammar checker. They've done the whole create the value bit. Uh, and so, so, but they now sell these lovely plugins to, uh, to people and you can, you know, for, for much less money, get a better open source product. And they have some of those nice AI things in there, you know. And AI is cool. Of course, for checking an ISBN is valid, probably not the best use of AI, I, I might argue. Um, but, but on the other hand, sentence structure and human language, you know, that, that, can be, um, that can be pretty cool. So they're taking on Grammarly. And the nice thing about that, of course, is you can get a Docker image and you can deploy that in your Kubernetes, you know, whatever, and connect it up to uh, Collabor Online so all of your grammar checking stays in-house. So you get the benefit of all of that, that goodness. And, uh, you know, from a European free software company, I love it. And, and they're doing well, and they're growing, they're growing really nicely. So nice to, see, nice to see that happen. Very easy to set up. And they even, they even documented the API nicely, which is kind of cool. So uh, you can see all of the you know, number of features exposed in some of the JSON uh, API they have at that URL. But again, very simple endpoints. You know, you just send your stuff to check, and you get some answers back, and we show it. And then, of course, you can configure that uh, as you like. Uh, and they have a web service. I mean, another example of just sending text and getting text back is our Deeple integration. So another, another easy thing there that's often useful for people. Um, and yeah, it, <clears throat> yeah, it's a bit interesting, this. So, so obviously, they want to try and retain formatting, which is probably one of the big uh, advantages over pasting it into your web browser. Um, but you can, you can buy an enterprise key for Deeple and use that, but you, you're not going to have it on premise, I guess. Um, and then trying to really get styles through HTML and map them back properly is, is more challenging than you might imagine. Um, and we haven't done a very good job of it. So if anyone wants to improve that, they're very welcome to, uh, you know, to come and contribute. But I think this, this idea of you know, ask, the, ask the computer to improve my document and stuff, that interaction thing is there and working, working nicely. And there's lots of easy low-hanging fruit if people want to... Uh, to help do cool stuff. <clears throat> so, so one of the other um, things we try and do is we try and integrate outside the, the iframe. It's interesting. So you create virtualization, for example, and all, almost all of the interesting thing about virtualization is the bit that isn't virtualized, you know, the bit where you can punch through the magic to not virtualize something and, and you know, run the command inside the... Anyway, so um, similarly with us, you know, the, the integration is, is probably the most interesting bit around the edge. And it's much the best if you can do that. So we've written a huge SDK so that you're, it's easy to do, um, which you can see online. Um, and so when you save as, it seems easy to save as, right? But I just explained to you how it works. You know, you do a get and you do a post, and that's, that's kind of easy for us. Um, but if you want to save it as something else, <clears throat> that's more tricky. So, but yet people kind of want that if they're editing a document. They, they you know... Often people load a document and they continually save it as through its lifetime. So the document you get actually started in 
1995, you know, and it's been saved as ever since, you know, with a nice template and the WMF preview of, of Windows Metafile in the top right corner and all of that good stuff. And often we see the macros in it. I mean, we're analyzing government macros and we routinely see like the Windows, uh, the Office 95 macro API had a compatibility when Office 97 arrived. And, and we're still seeing that in macros, you know, the word basic dot something thing. Just extraordinary. Anyway, save as is used. So we should do that. I talk very quickly. Who, is, who has got lost? Does anyone, you know, no? You're all, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, so we need a file picker. So how are we going to get that? Well, I mentioned this check file info thing that tells, tells us what you can cope with. And if you say, well, we can do insert remote image and we can do this right relative thing, then we'll send you a post message when you click save as. We send a post message outside the frame saying, hey, we want a graphic from somewhere, you know? And then you can do what you like. You pop up your nice file picker, come arbitrary image creator, ASCII art, you know, whatever thing. We don't, we don't care. And when you've done, send us this action insert graphic and just a URL to it, and we'll put it in the document. That's kind of cool. Or we'll save as and, and reload and, you know, create a, a window for, the, for the, new, uh, the new document. So that's really useful and easy, easy to do. And we're using, I think, the same hooks for our new export uh, stuff. So there's a whole lot of work in accessible PDF creation and PDF UA. And I mean, look at all these options. I mean, I, I hate options. But, you know, apparently you need all of these. So, um, so we've added loads of them recently. And you'll be pleased. And of course, Repub, it's very, very useful for accessibility. It's kind of an extended HTML uh, dialect. Um, so, so, you know, you can integrate easily and get all of this richness uh, suddenly. One of our problems, of course, is that interoperability is really, really key in what we're doing. And uh, people really care about that. And one of the challenges we have at the moment is, um, is our competition really is not, not great at interoperability. Uh, they're spoilt by interoperating with themselves a whole lot, which is easier. And, um, and so when we save, I mean, we love ODF, right? But if you save in an ODF file, and hey, Neil's good to see you, um, and then you, you sort of download it somewhere else uh, and give it to someone on a Windows machine, like us not, they'll load it in Word. And it will completely mangle the document. You know, they even have a, a big list of the things they break. You know, there's a, I don't know if it's a thousand pages. It's a very large document that explains all the things they don't do, you know, change tracking. I mean, why would you want that, you know? You know what kind of features? Anyway, so, so lots of it is dropped on the floor, which would be fine, because obviously that product is awful. But it's sad to be blamed, you know, for someone. I mean, like, you know, the user perception is, your product doesn't interoperate. And you're like... Are you sure it's me? You know, like, I don't know. So, of course, if you, use, if you use the docx file format, tragically, you know, we can interoperate better with the other, other world, which is a shame. But the good news is you do, shouldn't need to do that. You can use it all online in the browser, and you can feel happy and relaxed knowing it's in ODF format on your server, and you have a full feature experience. Uh, but anyway, I was distracted. Remote font management. So, so that's all very good, but if you've re ever written slides, uh, what you'll notice is that you, know, that you change the wording of this, this line here until it just about fits in and doesn't wrap horribly. You know? And that's great, but of course it's highly dependent on the font being used. And if you change the font, be it ever so slightly, uh, you know, the text can grow and then everything looks awful. And of course my slides look awful anyway, just because I'm, I'm a hacker, but uh, other people have beautiful looking slides. And um, so anyway, we decided it was very useful to be able to configure fonts, and that brings a whole load of interesting problems. Um, but anyway, to make this even easier, we have remote configuration. So, so one of the things that's nice is to be able to deploy lots of images on Kubernetes and demand scale and more and more of these things. Um, but it's a bit of a pain to configure them. And particularly for a large hoster or something, you know, you have customers that arrive quite regularly and add things. And how are you going to deal with that? And do you restart all the... What, what do you do? So we have this remote configuration endpoint now, so you can cut a whole lot of your config out. And Collabor Online just go, hey, tell me my config. Oh, has it changed? And they pull it every minute or so and update a whole subset of, of those settings uh, to make it easier. And one of those, of course, is the font, font setting. So it's easy to have then a path to font. So if you have a file sync and share thing and you can manage files, you know, just create a folder and drop loads of fonts in it and then we'll notice. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we uh, just get this, this kind of JSON come out of that font endpoint, this, this thing we, we configure in. That tells us where they are, and ideally some timestamps, so we don't, you know, continually fetch them. And then we can just build a whole set of fonts. And in the background, it's very funky um, because we have a four kit. So, 
you can't fork if you have threads, and it's kind of useful to have threads. So we, we initialize LibreOffice in what we call the fork it, whose job is just to fork. And uh, we pre-initialize everything, load our configuration, and then we fork and copy on write huge amounts of our, our, our static data. So if you've started LibreOffice and thought, well, it took several seconds. What am I going to do online? Of course, absolutely instant. We fork within you know, milliseconds, and we have a document there ready, ready to load and open. Um, but the problem is it really needs all the fonts, and we really don't want to hand all of those fonts to the child processes, and we really control this very carefully from a security perspective. So anyway, after lots of work, we now restart this, respawn, load, load files and pass them in and patch lots of infrastructure. I was actually just talking to Leonard only a few minutes ago about, he was telling me, oh, you've got to mount proc, you have to mount proc, you'll get screwed over, you have to mount devices, otherwise something will go wrong in your stack somewhere. And we're like, yeah, well, you know, we, we tested that and we, you know, fixed and we patched around those things so that actually, you know, our jails have almost nothing in them, no proc, only two devices in slash dev, no shell, you know, they're, they're pretty well locked down. So we like that. Oh, and, and then uh, I've got a few minutes, so I'll just show you a whole load of gratuitous uh, features we've added, just in case you like features. Uh, the users do, turns out. So I'm, I'm a big uh, hater of the blockchain, but uh, DevDAO uh, actually uh, sponsored some of this work, so we like that. And the European Commission as well. Um, so, so getting our, our columns into our spreadsheets, lots of them, uh, is, uh, has been happening. And it's got rid of this, this very annoying dialogue that plagued lots of users uh, for a long time, so that's really cool. Oh, and there's even the proper credit, well, NGI Datsy. So the European Union Horizon Research Program is actually really cool. Um, and anyone who uh, knows about it, if you have a good idea, the traditional way of getting funding from the European Union was that if you have a really good idea, you need to find 15 other people across 27 countries and then try and persuade them all that their idea is the same thing and then get someone to write the proposal and submit it and then you don't get it because it's all inconsistent. So... Um, the good thing about the, the NGI uh, uh, DAPC, the Horizon research thing, was that they said, hey, let's do something that's good for Europeans. And uh, so they would just give money um, to a single vision uh, of stuff. And our vision was, well, let's fix interoperability. So we did a lot of that, and they paid, which is awesome. Look at that. That's, that's yeah, you know, it just makes life so much easier, doesn't it? And probably good for Europe as well. So anyway, uh, so form, form controls, creating lots of nice, uh, rich text folders, much better PDF export with creating real editable PDFs actually built into the product rather than having to layer things over the top afterwards, um, starting to theme colors so that you can select different bits of your document and change the theme and see, see how that impacts the whole document. And we're, we're doing lots of work here to extend that uh, to writer and calc. Chart data tables, you wouldn't believe it, but these things at the bottom of charts are very popular in presentations. Some people like lines and other people like numbers, and now you can do both in the same, the same thing. It's a key interoperability thing. And then also other random interop things, you know, precisely anchoring your images and reflowing your text very nicely in the browser, uh, improving our formula input bar, um, accessibility checker to try and find problems in your documents for the visually impaired, uh, prettier dialogue functionality, so happening in the client side, and lots of this is now JavaScript in the client side to make it more accessible and performant. Um, we completely reworked the tile serving thing, so Instead of sending new tiles when things change, we send very small deltas of them. So we, we, we find the pixels that change, and then we Z standard compress them. So we switch from big PNGs with like even headers in them and crazy stuff to uh, much smaller uh, Z standard compressed things. Thanks to Facebook. I just need to thank Facebook for uh, helping us all get digital sovereignty back. You know, that's, uh, that's important, you know. Um, Password options, so you can put passwords on your files and various attributes, lots I've mentioned, the PDF things, embedded video playbacks, if you like, if you like uh, that sort of thing. And uh, the last silly idea, I think, in the, in the few, few seconds I have left. Um, so we've done a bit of a concept for running Calabra Online in the browser, so when you go through your tunnel, and uh, my hope is that tunnels get better connectivity, but... Uh, you can then click a button and, in theory, run this thing uh, offline. So we have a prototype now of Collabor Online. If you're interested in that, there'll be talks in the LibreOffice track, which is, I suppose, somewhere nearby, um, that then allows you to edit offline. And there are a whole lot of interesting problems there. If you like wrestling with massive multi-gigabyte linkages and horrible, horrible nightmares, do get involved with that. But there's a, there's a little prototype there that will allow you to, um, to work on uh, work on that and play with WASM. So, yeah, come hack with us. We have HackFest. So there's a LibreOffice HackFest. If you're excited about LibreOffice, and you should be, 
Uh, the cool kids are all using LibreOffice technology. Come to our Hackfest this, this Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we have a community dinner tonight with Pasta at the Business and Technology Incubator. Uh, and there's a, there's a great link there. If you take a photo of it, you'll have it for later, so you can come along. And beyond that, uh, we're running a Hackfest uh, in Clare College, Cambridge, in March 28th and 29th, uh, which is not only LibreOffice, but also Collabor Online. And it would be lovely to see you there. Um, if you want to come and stay in a beautiful Cambridge College and wine and dine at our expense and have some uh, team building and get stuck into uh, Collabor Online, we'd love to have you with us. So uh, thank you for your patience. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Ah, yes, sir. When can we expect the chat GPC integration with Collabora? Well, you know, like I say, uh, yeah, when can we expect chat GPT integration with Collabora? I'm sorry, I have to repeat the question. Yes, so it's a really good question. I mean, ultimately, we, you can select some text and we can send that to you and you, you, you can, can send it back quite, quite easily. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, AI brings a whole lot of interesting challenges and I think. I don't know if you've looked at Office 365 and the AI slide improver, which I obviously should have used, you know. Um, the, it, it makes your slides look pretty. Um, but the question is, what are pretty slides? And, you know, the real problem in AI is, of course, the training data. And one of our problems is that we like this digital sovereign world where we don't spy on people all the time to work out what they're doing to their, their documents, right? So Microsoft doesn't have this problem. They have Office 365 and they're constantly watching, you know. So... Uh, so they know how to make pretty slides just by watching millions of people go, oh, that color's a bit... And also offering you options of different ways to break or improve your slide and seeing what you choose. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, how do, we, how do we build the data sets to let us do this in an open source way? And I think AI is fantastically interesting, and, and Bradley, no doubt, will come up with the Afero Afero AI, AI license, you know. Uh, I'm sure this is happening, because... <coughs> The source is banal beyond belief in most AI, you know, things. It's the data and the training data and the model, model you build. Um, so, yeah, I would, it would suck to be an open source company, 100% open source code. There's just this massive binary blob that not even we understand that you have to buy, you know, to make it useful. Um, so, so, I don't know. We're, we're working on the problem. And there are a lot of smart minds uh, thinking about putting AI um, and keeping that sovereign and on-premise. But uh, I don't have a perfect answer. But it's a fantastic question. And if you want to do uh, chat GPT, we should, uh, we should talk. You know, come and see me. Come. I did I mention we're hiring people? I'm probably not supposed to. But we love C++ hackers. If you come and see me, you know, we, uh, we're growing, growing fast and doing some cool things. Other questions? Anyone at all? No? More? Yeah? Well, that's, that's very good of you then. Come and see me afterwards if you want to chat. Please do. Thank you so much. <clears throat>